Hey there, Cheryl here. It is a special day because I am here with amazing Lori from Healthline Media VP Customer Insights. Lori, thank you for taking a few minutes out of your incredibly busy schedule to be here. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for bringing me on, Cheryl. And I just, before we hop into it, I want you to tell everyone how we met, where we met, and then a little bit about the conversation that we had and how it changed and shifted a perspective during kind of an interesting time for you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you and I met at the Women of Silicon Valley conference a few years ago, um, and you did not know this when we met, um, but I was going through a pretty challenging time in my career, and um, what you said in that organ in that group really resonated. So I came up to you afterwards. We started a conversation, um, and then connected a few times after that. Um, and I think for me, those few conversations, they planted the seeds for so much growth. Um, and I was able to come out of a really tough time, um, not, not bruised and battered, but stronger and, and truly having learned from the experience. And I think that the tools that you gave me for understanding how to really be accountable to myself and to the people that I work with how to grow from a challenging place. Um, I mean, they were absolutely invaluable. So thank you so much. It's been really an honor to have that conversation and keep track of your amazing career. And I wanna talk about all the incredible things happening at Healthline and what you've been able to spearhead, not just spearhead, but really help people get through this challenging time. And also to the benefits that you've seen from being able to work remotely. And like we were talking about before we hopped on live, like having this, you know, having your team being very humanized because you're in their homes and seeing their families and all of that. So we're going to talk about that. But before we hop in, you know, a lot of times I would say more often than not, or pretty much always when leaders have achieved a certain level of success, something has inspired them at a young age. And so whether it is boosted them up to believing that they could conquer the world or maybe a big challenge that they really dedicated their life's work to making sure that those who come after them, their life, you know, is easier. So can you give us, um, speaking of insights, a little insight to, you know, the, the younger Lori when you were a young person. Um, I mean, you're still young, but you know what I mean. <laughs> younger. Um, what inspired you to get into your line of work and also what really influenced you during an impressionable age? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. And we haven't talked about this, Cheryl, before, um, you know, because when I think about what inspired me, I never I, I grew up never knowing I couldn't do anything. You know, I grew up from with um, just surrounded by incredibly strong women. Um, my family in particular, my grandmother, my mother, my aunts, I mean, these are strong women. And I was raised to believe that our voices mattered, our choices mattered. These were women who, you know, they, they marched, they got arrested in civil rights movements, um, you know, and, and the memory that came to my mind really strongly was my grandmother. It used to drive me crazy, but she, she never called me like sweetie or honey or little girl. She always called me woman. Woman? You know, come over here, talk to me, woman. And it was such a funny thing that it just sparked in my mind the sense that I always grew up knowing that I could mm -hmm. and that I and that I needed to. You know, we evaluate the quality of our lives on our ability to do our part to make things right, to make things better, to stand up for justice. Mm -hmm. That's what I was raised on. And and so I think, you know, I can point to specific times in my life when maybe I lost that, you know, it's, it's hard to carry that spirit forward as a girl, a young woman in our society. Um, but that light was so strong on me as a little kid and I'll always be thankful for it and, and learning to tap back into it and be more free with that um, as I grow and get older. That's the gift of wisdom of not being so young. Yeah. And that is so important. And also keeping in mind that not everyone grew up with that. Yeah. You know? And so to pass that on, and I don't know if you call your team woman, like, hey, woman, get over here. 
<laughs> you know, it's funny because I I would never say that to someone. That would be, you know, unusual. Uh, my grandma was strong and unusual. But that feeling of like, you are here to change the world and, and who better than you is a feeling that I bring into my relationships, my mentoring relationships with men and women. Yeah. And just to, you know, lean into and shine a light on that a little bit, what we were talking about, some of the philosophies of Healthline before we're going to give really, I promise we're going to give some hints as to how to build really important customer insights. But before we go there, I really want you to elaborate on what we talked a little bit about um, before we went live. And that is, you know, the importance of speaking up, the importance of reaching out. You were saying that you make a conscious effort of reaching out twice a week, maybe to some people on your team, but also a message. I was going to say a message to young people or people that are earlier in their career, but it's also a message to leaders who are on boards or in the C-suite or what have you, just reaching out to leadership and saying, you know, I've noticed this or do you need help with that just to let you know I'm here for you. Um, so can you elaborate on that and what you've been doing and how that has really helped your career and build strength in your team? Yeah, I think um, I think particularly women have we grow and we have we thrive and in the past even more so on informal connections, informal networks. The formal structures of power are often so close to women that we become very strong in informal networks. And we learn how to find that mentor, notice that powerful woman, notice that new hire who seems really bright and seems like they've got something to say and bring them forward, right? All of those informal networks often require physical proximity. We need to see each other, physically see each other. Um, you know, there was a, a woman in my team who recently joined in a leadership position, and she talked about how in any other time, she would have spent her first couple of weeks just watching. Who's walking down the halls together? Who's walking into meetings and coming out together? Who's here late? Who's here early? Um, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing, right? She would have been reading the room, and there is no room to read. So all of these informal structures that a lot of us have learned to grow and navigate and thrive in, we don't have anymore. We gotta be, we've got to be um, explicit. We've got to actually mindfully, consciously build connections. And that requires, it's required at least in me, a couple of things. One is um, I'm an introvert by nature. And so I often rely on lists of people to connect with. Uh, and I, I learned in business school that time is short. You'll never have the time to reach out to everyone you want to. So you need to be really thoughtful and make sure that you are making those connections. And, and I've done a lot of that. So I do. I challenge myself two people a week, you know, just personal outreach. And that can be someone in any part of my network, anywhere in a hierarchy. So I do push myself out there um, with structure. And the other piece is more emotional, which is you just have to let go of worrying. Does this person want to hear from me? Do I have something to say that's worthwhile? Could I really help them? Right. Does that senior leader actually want to hear my idea? Does that new hire actually think I could do anything for her or him? Forget that. The world is not served by you playing small. Give it a try. Reach out. Um, I've always welcomed that kind of outreach from anyone who connected with me. And so I think we all just have to believe enough in our own worth and value to do that outreach. And I would imagine anybody watching this, you could probably think right now, like you could sit down and just rattle off five names of people that you wish you could connect with. Why not give it a try? You know, we have to be very, um, very mindful and we have to be the ones that take the risk to kind of do, do that outreach, even if it feels a little awkward. Because the elevator pitch, the coffee conversation, those aren't going to happen, right? And we can't help each other grow unless we find a way to do that kind of connection in a new way. Yeah. And you know that I'm going to quote you on the world is not served by you playing small. No. Yeah. Well, that was me quoting Marianne Williamson, but I, it rolls in my head constantly. Yeah. You know, who am I not to be the one? The yeah. So there's really no time left for a fear or doubt. Um, and people really need to be cared for more than ever, especially leaders. So if there's any hesitation uh, on you either asking for help or reaching out 
to see if someone else needs help, um, even if it's someone that you think will never in a million years take your call or talk to you or find your offer or request um, seriously or take it seriously, just do it. So mm -hmm. I love that recommendation. I also love that you said make it specific. You're like two a week because that holds, it's so much better than saying, oh, I'm going to reach out more because that doesn't mean anything. And we can take it a step further and say, okay, well, a lot of times, you know, when you link things to other habits, then it you can create new habits. So maybe it would be on, let's say you have something that you're already doing. Let's say you have meetings on Tuesday, Thursday, or what have you, and say, I'm going to show up 10 minutes early and make a quick reach out before each, you know, or even take it even make it more specific of when, you know, you're going to do it. I want to steal another thing from a really wise person in our company, Dan Feldman, who recommended using Zoom buttons as your prompts, right? We all have different um, stimuli that remind us to do things during the day. That join button, when I hit that join button, I look at the button and it's my reminder to connect mm -hmm. and to lift people up. I remind myself this I'm in this call to listen and learn and lift, right? And, and the button is my prompt. And then you, I, I don't do it this one, but you could, you know, when you sign off a call, you can use that leave button, that visual prompt. It's like, this is my prompt to step back and think about who I could connect with today. Um, you know, those are, those are little things, but this isn't, this is something new in our lives we didn't have before. Um, and you can use prompts like that. I love that habit formation. Um, you know, you can use the science of habits to get, to get something like that worked into your day. Um, but, you know, it took me a long time to really understand that that networking and building relationships it doesn't happen organically. All right. I used to think that was so icky to, oh, I have to consciously build relationships. But you really do need to put that time in. And especially as we get busier in our lives and now that we're remote, if you're not thinking about it consciously, it doesn't happen. Yeah. And that is true. You know, we're talking about our networks at work, but also we can be in our personal relationships. Yeah. But, you know, we're talking about customer insight. So let's circle back to and talk about how this applies to that and checking in on clients or prospects or past clients just to see how they're doing to gain some insight. So what everyone I'm sure has really been waiting for, can you share some of your expertise now that relationships are more important now than ever? We've touched a little bit about, you know, personally and also with with our colleagues, but when it comes to our customers or prospects, how can we possibly build deeper connections with people, customers or prospects virtually? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, it's really such an honor to do what I do right now, you know, working consumer in Sites. The thing that got me excited about this was that I just find people fascinating, um, and and what and I really believe that the way that we affect real change, the way that we that we really build better, build a better world, is by listening carefully to our clients and to our users and to our customers. That is how you affect change in an organization. That is how you build genuine and authentic relationships. So what my team gets to do at Healthline is really lift up the voice of our users. Right, we spend our time through quantitative and qualitative research, just paying close attention to the lived experiences of the people who we're trying to serve. And by doing that, we accomplish a couple of things. One is we're able to innovate, right? Because we hear things, we hear people talking about unmet needs that you cannot find just through an iterative process of making things a little bit better, a little bit better, right? So the way this might apply to someone in customer services, you know, take that time interview your past clients, really, really listen. Listen for their words because they will tell you what they need that they're not getting. And you can build something new based on that. So I'm a big believer in qualitative interviews. I'm a big believer in careful listening, transcriptions, reviewing over and over. You would be amazed what you can find. And, and what I find in my role in a larger organization is that I can bring statistics to my leadership and to all of our creative folks and designers and editors and product managers. And I can tell them what I think is going to work, what new approaches, but I can share one story with them, one video, one person talking about their lives. And that is the thing that makes the change. 
So I really do believe in the power of careful listening and stories to drive innovation. And I also think that it is the primary driver of organizational change. Yeah, and I just to back you up on that, I'm rereading the book Influence. It's by the folks. There's five authors. They wrote Crucial Conversations. Um, and they're talking about personalizing just what you're exactly what you're saying personalizing stories. So in other words, you know, in hospitals, rather than saying, we need to reduce the amount of, you know, injuries that surgeons are calling, you know, they pull in Betty, who had a kidney transplant go wrong, or, you know, what have you, and just making it really personal. So there is, I'm backing you up 100% about there's research behind this, really getting to know people. And I wanted to ask you a question that may or may not make you a little uncomfortable, um, but it's top of mind. And I think it's so important about taking this to the next level. And let's talk about make the importance of stories, especially with groups that are marginalized, because a lot of times those stories aren't being told either. And I think to have real change, we're really not, we really need to understand those experiences as well. And so can you talk a little bit about how Healthline that's front of mind and also how they're helping there? Absolutely, yeah, it's my honor to talk about this work. So um, at Healthline, we have been engaged in some really, really deep work um, since the summer and really ongoing in raising up issues of particularly race and equity in health. Um, and we've done that multiple ways. You can go to healthline.com and you can read um, our editor's incredible letter about racism as a health crisis. Um, you can find content that we've written around these issues. Um, and I think that it's something that we're thinking about all the time. Um, to your point, Cheryl, you know, we had, we, what my team has gotten to do really over these last few months is to try to build lasting organizational change through powerful storytelling. Um, and through and not through trying to overlay our own expertise or statistics, but by actually just raising up voices, listening very carefully through through our research to the experiences of people who experience racism in our healthcare system, who have been denied care, excluded from the healthcare system, excluded from treatment, needed treatment and wellness, um, diminished through their experiences with our healthcare system. Our job as a team is to listen to those stories and to elevate them and to bring them to people who can meaningfully address them. And what does that mean in a situation like, you know, in, a, in an organization like, like Healthline? Well, that means our conscious language team employs different language. We actually change our medical standards for how we write about health conditions to make sure that we are reflecting all experiences. We are conscious as we are talking about conversations with doctors. We, we would never just say, talk to your doctor about this, because we are aware now that, that talking to a doctor about a condition can be very different for people coming from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ethnicities. Um, and, and that information makes powerful change because it's not just a statistic or a bullet point in someone's mind telling them they need to make a change. It's a face, it's a story. Um, right. So my my recommendation would be for those of you who are in organizations and you're actually trying to change the way that your organization works. This could be professional or personal. Trying to actually learn and grow. Bring in stories. Right. Bring in the stories of people who your work affects and let those stories really live. Uh, you know, we, we are constantly sharing quotes from our users. We are posting, we, post, we used to have them on our walls. Now we post them in our Slack channels as graphics, constantly reinforcing the message that we work with real people. There are real people on the other side of our screens who are affected by what we do. Our choices matter to them. And I can say it all day long with chat, charts and graphs, but one story, one story can really change um, someone's heart. And when that happens, then they take action. So for me, research and listening is the foundation of storytelling and storytelling is the foundation of change. Yeah, so, so important. And I also want to piggyback off that idea too, because you know a lot of people are feeling right now like they're in mile 27 of a marathon 
you know, like when things happen in like March, April, they're like, oh, it's a terrible thing. But then we'll have summer and summer. Yeah. We'll have and then we're like, oh, well, maybe not. And then we're like, now everyone's like, oh, and it's it's really a systemic problem right now in companies. Um, it Now that this is most important, but the reality is it's costing companies, U.S. companies, a lot of money because people are starting to slow down. And the one thing thing that's going to be vital to employees kind of accelerating into Q4 and emerging next year, refreshed and motivated and excited and ready to go and drive growth is going to be just what you were talking about. And it's going to be for them to understand, get in touch with their highest sense of integrity and with their customer stories, because it's that intrinsic motivator bonuses and all these external things only motivate people so far. So what you said is going to be so important to understand our customers, but also to understand teams and to drive motivation to wrap up what's been a pretty interesting year. So yeah. thanks, like for bringing that up. It's funny. I used to, I used to run marathons. I hope to run marathons again someday. And one of the things that they used to always tell us is um, if you have, if you have people who are going to come and watch to help coach them a little bit, um, you know, let's say you're standing at mile 24, you, no matter where you are actually on the course, you never want to tell somebody you're almost done. You're, you're almost done. What you say is you're doing it <laughs> because mile 25 could feel like you have so far to go. Right. And, and we don't actually even know where our finish line is. So we can't say to each other, this is almost over, or this is going to get better right around the corner, right? Or this is going to get easier. I don't know what your journey is or story is. It may get harder for you before it gets easier. But what I can say, honestly, to everybody listening today, I say this to my team, we say this to each other is, you're doing it, right? You're doing it. We are here. We are here together. And we are here for a reason. And our why is what keeps you know keeps us coming back. Um, I have started to envision coming going back to the office, not in the sense of like trying to escape this moment, but in the sense of what do I want to bring back with me? What do I want my team to bring back? Right? I want us to come back together feeling more connected than ever because we did this together. Mm -hmm. you know? And and I want us to feel a sense of pride and a sense of knowing each other better than we ever would have known each other if we hadn't had to go through this. Um, so I'm trying to stay very present and just look everyone in my team in the eye and say, you're doing this, doing it together now. But I'm also starting to see that next thing and envision how I can make us strong for that. That's what motivates me right now. Yeah, that's so, so important. I agree with you a hundred percent. Excuse me. And before we sign off, if you can leave everyone with one more way, I know that story is important. As a matter of fact, I spent 18 months studying story and for speaking. And I learned more about storytelling than I ever thought was possible. And it uncovered what I don't know, but it's that was been amazing journey on that and how senior leaders can start to get transparent with their teams and why they need what they need or why they're pushing as hard as they're pushing and really making things personal. But now that relationships are more important than ever and sometimes more difficult than ever, can you leave everyone with maybe one strategy, either what's most important when telling these stories or a different strategy that's going to be very important to building and solidifying stories going into the end of the year and into next year? Hmm, that's a really good question. I think, um, first of all, recognizing that we are in exceptional times is always important and, and, and owning that universally, right? You know, when I speak, I own that I am challenged as well as, you know, and I'm not just talking from a neutral place about other people who are going through something hard. We are all in this story. We are all a part of it. Um, letting yourself be emotionally affected by what you're talking about is a really valuable aspect of this. Um, to share someone else's story is an honor. It is a privilege. Those people took the time to share their stories, 
right? They are, they gave that to us that we may take action on it. And so my recommendation would be to listen carefully, listen to your clients, listen to your users, your customers, share those stories, but let yourself be affected by it. Um, the most powerful storytellers that I know bring themselves into the room as well. You don't try to be a neutral observer. They share when something makes them sad, makes them angry, right? Gives, makes them curious or excited. Um, and, and those are the stories that really resonate with folks. So be, bring yourself into this work as well. Um, and that's, a, that's another way to honor the stories that you're telling. Mm -hmm. And those stories will drive emotion. And as Maya Angelou would say, it's the emotion and how people feel that's going to help them remember you not so much the, what you do or what you say. So thank you for bringing that amazing piece of information to light. It has been an honor to speak with you today, Lori, you uh, and Healthline are doing a lot of amazing things. I wanna bring everyone's attention to what's scrolling down below and the link. Can you just explain for a second what that is and why why you put it there and you know who might wanna click on that? Yeah, so something that I'm really proud of from our work at Healthline is we really have a strong emphasis on mental health as, as such a huge aspect of health. And we've put together some really, I think, really, really strong resources on mental health support. Um, some of them are specifically related to mental health as we all navigate the pandemic. Some, um, many of them are more kind of just evergreen resources. Um, and I think all of us right now are experiencing unprecedented mental health challenges. You know, Cheryl, one of the things I mentioned to you is that even early on in the pandemic, our research showed that people, the thing that people were having the most trouble finding was help managing grief, managing trauma. And that is not even something that a lot of people have the language to know that they need to seek. So I just want to encourage everyone here to honor your own need for mental health support and, and please leverage the resources that we've put together. I'm so proud of this work that my colleagues have done and I hope it is helpful to you or to the people that you care about. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Lori. Be sure and click on the link, uh, www.healthline.com forward slash mental health. So thanks again, Lori. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Appreciate your time and keep on being a limitless leader and inspiring others to do the same. Look forward to connecting again soon. Thank you so much for this time. It's been really great.